Descrito por el Financial Times como la autoridad líder en instrumentos antiguos, Florian Leonard se encuentra entre los luthieres más solicitados mundialmente. Asesora actualmente a los más destacados instrumentistas como Anne-Sophie Luther y Leonidas Cavacos, entre otros. Y su lutería Florian Leonard Fine Violins se encuentra en Londres, donde está su sede, San Francisco en Estados Unidos, Seúl en Corea del Sur y Hong Kong. Por la gracia de Dios, conocí a Florian a los 14 años de edad durante un concierto nuestro en la ciudad de Londres mientras cursaba estudios en la Yehudi Menuhin School, una escuela de niños precoces de la música clásica. Él ha impulsado nuestra carrera de una manera increíble y ha provisto los extraordinarios violines Stradivarius con los que he podido tocar alrededor del mundo durante nuestras giras mundiales en lugares tales como el Carnegie Hall, el National Philharmonic Hall en Vilna, incluyendo nuestro teatro nacional dos veces. La última vez, eh, más recientemente, para la gala inaugural de la temporada 2022 de nuestra Orquesta Sinfónica Nacional y el maestro José Antonio Moya. Me place hoy tenerlo como invitado especial para la charla inaugural de la quinta clínica musical de la Fundación Music for Life desde Londres, gracias al Banco Popular Dominicano, principal propulsor de las clínicas de la Fundación. It is such a pleasure to have you here, Florian. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, as I was thinking about the introduction I made, suddenly I thought of your beginnings and I wondered how such a great name now, Florian Leonard Fine Violins, was made and, and what was your dream when you were little and started to know about classical music? Oh wow, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me here in your beautiful country. It was your idea to bring me here and it's my pleasure to, to if it's possible, to, to stimulate more interest in this, in this field that is absolutely my passion, passion all my life. Um, and yeah, we met when you were quite a young girl and you, you were a young talent that came from an island where that usually doesn't have classical music uh, students in London. So I thought that's uh, also very exciting to see someone who brings the message home and inspires more young people to follow you. And I think you're doing that today, which uh, I congratulate you for. In, in, in my uh, history, um, I first always wanted to be a, a doctor, a surgeon, and because I enjoyed creating things, repairing things. So I, my attitude in my, in my brain, I think, was that I like to fix things, repair things, um, make them work again. I thought that's a very exciting uh, concept. Um, but in the end, I fell in love with violin making because I played cello, my mother played the violin, and I found a guitar on the loft and a friend of mine had a double bass with a broken neck. I fixed it for him. So I was fixed things for friends. And there, that's what, what sparked my interest in violin making. And then I suddenly absolutely wanted to go to violin making school. There's one in South Germany that's quite world famous. They only took 12 people. And at my time, there were 1,200 people applying for the school. And they only took 10. So and uh, so, I was so determined that I would want to be one of those few that gets into the school that prob pro probably mixed with my 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 talent, but also my strong wish to be in that school that I succeeded to get in. And then my next dream was to work in Hill and Sons in in London, and a company that doesn't exist anymore, but was there for 300 years. And um, they took me, and, it, and I became workshop manager in this company, and suddenly I had to restore the finest, be most beautiful instruments in the world, um, adjust them, create bridges and restorations for the best musicians worldwide that came to this shop and that gave me exposure to these great instruments and the players, so to learn from each side. Plus, I learned from a 300 years tradition in a, in, a, in a shop that I didn't have to doubt. So I didn't have to doubt their authenticity, because their, their certificates were very famous. 
uh, their restorations were very famous too. And while I have still improved by today on certain attitudes, how to restore, to more preserve, etc., um, they have given me an absolute enormous basis to study. And one of the subjects I, I have also studied for myself, something you can't enroll in university in, was to, to, um, to study for expertise. So that means authentication. So I need to look at an instrument and see by details, by the way a, a channel is built, the ground and the texture of the varnish, the original varnish, the inlays, the, the small details of the purfling mitres and so on, the, the way the ribs are constructed, the way the airfoils are shaped and constructed and placed, and this whole scroll, which is like a handwriting of a person, is carved like a sculpture. It all reveals something of a maker, and it gives me the idea where, when, and by whom this item was created. Of course, many, many, many times I don't know, and I can only guess a little bit. In that case, I cannot write, it's made by, but maybe you can then narrow it down to say it was made in this country at around this time by this kind of maker, or probably. You have to be very careful when you authenticate and only if you really know, because you can go by a reference example, let's say an original label is inside, that helps you to relate to another instrument as well. So this is something I very passionately followed right away from, from my beginnings at Hills, because they had so many authentic instruments, and I could build my knowledge on this, because you cannot build it if you see once or twice a year a nice instrument that might be original. You can absolutely not build it like this. So I needed that database for myself, for my own brain. And of course, I aided this by making notes every single day. Uh -huh. So And learn it like vocabulary, like a language. A, a little bit like a violinist would uh, learn to, of these, where to put the fingers, and also how to, to hold the bow, how to draw sound out of the bow, where to place it on the, on the violin. It's so many, many, many small items that, that add to one good thing. And it's a similar in my profession. Wow. So, Florian, when does the idea of opening your own shop um, comes up? And how does that fit in with, with what you do now um, in the sense of having many offices around the world in many continents? So. Uh, First of all, I moved from Germany to London during my time at Hills. Then I was in the privileged position as a violin restorer to be headhunted by several other companies. I worked for those and then it made most sense for me to move back to London because I thought London is a world city that, um, that has a lot of those European, uh, formerly European uh, cultural ideas, um, including classical music, but also restoration of anything antique, from books to to um, to, uh, to to furniture, to artifacts, etc. So um, I thought the climate there would be a very international one, and I think that suited me very well. Also, it uh, suited me personally very well to, to see people from all over the world. It's an interesting way to live, to meet different cultures and mix and mingle with them. Um, so I felt very comfortable, comfortable with that idea. So, um, so in 1995, I, I had already studied for 12 years my, my profession. Um, I thought my, the time was ripe to open my own business. I had several people who wanted to work for me already because I knew they can learn something from my skills. And I was happy to, to share those skills. And so I started in, 80, in 1995 right away with two people and within, in my workshop and within a year I had four and that, that grew to 15 relatively rapidly. Wow. 
and then the demand for what I could deliver to people it from sound adjustments to restoration to making but also advice in purchasing instruments that are good quality and uh, well priced um, I also felt there's a need to to expand a little bit to different continents and that's what uh, gave me the idea to open a few branches the thing is you cannot just open a branch because you have to find talent that you train so because I I'm famous for the restoration quality we can deliver worldwide. Mm -hmm. I could not um, compromise on the quality in each of the branches. So the people had to be trained in London for at least seven years for wow. by me after they were already violin makers. So they are already like 15 years themselves trained people and they had to be trustworthy in character and willing to enjoy working with me in those uh, branches. So that is very hard to find worldwide and hence I could only open a branch where I had the possi possibility of putting somebody there. So my the workshop, my former workshop manager in London who worked for me for 20 years there, he opened then the branch in Seoul. So he's now 24 years or working for me already. Um, which is, is quite nice because we know each other well. He knows completely what is good and not good to do with these fine instruments that cost a lot of money. It is. And um, so there's a big responsibility also for me. So I need to know that everything is all right over there when it's so far away. Wow. That is incredible, Florian. I had no idea of how long of a process it was to to become a, a luthier of, of your level and, and to train the people the way you have for so many years to open those branches that we now see with Florian Leonard Fine Violins all over the world. But of course, the story behind every success is, is an extraordinary effort to, to make it happen. So I congratulate you for that and I really take my hat off. Um, now I know there is um, a very important question for all of us and actually myself I would like to make it and it is what is the myth about Stradivarius mm -hmm. and this is something I'm sure you're you're very used to answering <laughs> but I would like uh, for you to to let us know what you think yeah I mean a Stradivari was an in incredible character so we have to start with the personality like like uh, you just commented on me reaching my goals and it takes so long before you get anywhere you need one thing perseverance and that's what I would also appeal to anybody who learns to study violin you have to persevere to, to, to go through thick and thin you have to train constantly even if you're already great you have to train again and again and again and when I look at Stradivari, you can really see when you study the work that he created throughout his life that he was somebody who was never fully happy with where he was today. So he always knew I can improve, I can better what I'm doing and I can develop it. And you can really see with his work, the earliest works we, have, we know of him are from 1666. Uh, he was born in 1644, probably. We don't 100% know it's his exact birthday, but quite probably 44, um, 1644. So he was, as a young 20-year-plus uh, old um, young man, um, embarking on his career as a violin maker. And, uh, and from that year on, we can see year by year his thinking behind how can I pr improve this instrument? How can I make a better arching? How can I change the varnish? How can I create more volume? So he very slowly changed his stylistics towards a, a violin that became more and more powerful and masculine. And that's the reason why we today like his violin so much because 
while at his times he maybe had a great foresight for what we need today without him having to think that but um, he created an instrument that projects with a relative ease in a very large hole unamplified because in those days we didn't have stereo systems we didn't have uh, amplifiers with electronic equipment so we simply had a hole we had smaller holes initially but they grew in size and the audiences grew it was no longer just played for a few dukes who in their mm. castle had uh, some friends or guests for dinner and were entertained by chamber ensemble but now you had uh, starting to have a public that also went to concerts and um, and that grew bigger and bigger and very soon people discovered that what Stradivari was changing in the violin would be more suitable for this environment and because also Stradivari became very he had a long life for 94 years old and he was strong until his last days he must have had great eyes and strength and good hands control because we can see violence that he clearly made himself in even 1736 he died in 1737 he was still under full in full control of what he was doing so he had a long life he was a strong character he was a character with direction and clarity and therefore he he ticked all the boxes. So, in terms of, if we call boxes, model, arching, varnish, ground, um, elegance in workmanship, placement of F holes, choice of wood for front, sides, and back, and scroll. Everything he did um, was. 10 out of 10, if you want, points. And that's why he deserves his place on, in this world as the god of the violin makers. Mm -hmm. um, even if we today can make also great violins, a few people, if they have understood how to feel in a way people could do three, four hundred years ago, because we today learn to have light switches, we have learn to get in a car, close the door, switch the engine and drive. So everything's very automate, automated today. And our attitude towards things are shaped by this. Our, sm our senses, smell, taste, hearing, eyes. So, so all those things are influenced by the way we live today, um, by the ease of things. In those days, people went to bed with the sunset and got up with the sunrise. They lived probably close to a forest, because in those days forests were everywhere, and uh, which gave us the wood um, for those instruments that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but also they lived near a forest that, that was very frightening. And people worshipped God because they couldn't explain what's going on with the thunder and lightning that was in the sky. What is that? If you imagine you didn't learn that in school, what it actually is, that is actually just a, just a electric uh, a current in the sky. We all learn it at school, but they didn't know that. So they see this thunder and lightning. They hear noises in the forest. Darkness can be scary. They didn't have street lighting. so. Therefore, people had much closer connection to nature and feeling and wood mm. and sounds. And you can see um, that in those times that not just Stradivari had this great feeling, but quite a few others around him. But Stradivari was the one who just fulfilled all the things the best way. He created the best sound, the most elegant, workmanship, the best wood, the best varnish, etc., etc. So therefore he got that, that position.
Thank you so much, Florian, for that. Um, it's very interesting to actually see the parallels, as I was mentioning to the students, uh, between actually you and Stradivarius and the tenacity, the perseverance, and the exhaustive process that you have to go through to achieve one little great thing. Um, and mm. it, it was wonderful listening to you about um, talk about Stradivarius. I would like to to ask you about the Stradivarius that they have been able to to hear here thanks to you because mm -hmm. I performed the Brahms Violin Concerto um, last year and then the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto this year. I think the years of the Stradivarius were 1686 and then 1690. 90. Mm -hmm. And uh, the 1690s was a long pattern, um, mm -hmm. is a long pattern Stradivarius. And what can you say about those instruments? I believe we have some um, footage of the concerts mm -hmm. and we would love to hear what you have to say about those instruments that they have actually heard. Mm -hmm. So the 1680s Strad is still from the Amatisse um, uh, period because we kind of divide up Stradivarius oeuvre into periods. So, so up to 1690, you have that Amatisse period because he was still quite influenced by the then king of violin making, Amati, mm. and uh, he he must have had some contact with Nicol, Nicolo Amati um, because in his first label that we know. From 1666, he writes alumnus, so pupil of Stradivari. Um, that label he never used again, and the theory goes that uh, Amati complained that you're not my student, don't put that label in there. Wow. So, in any case, so he was very strongly influenced by this, even though he already showed his personality and, and uh, changing ideas. Um, but in 1690, that was a clear year of change. Mm -hmm. So he, he had clearly been influenced by outside factors. He must have seen instruments by someone from Brescia, which is like a couple of hours walk away from Cremona, um, where there was another contemporary maker, Gaspara de Salo. Um, actually, he was a little before him, but in any case, he must have seen his instruments. Um, they were longer and fuller arched. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what you certainly see happening in 1690. He makes that fuller arching, which has a less channel, mm -hmm. and therefore it's a little stronger, yes. um, and uh, makes the pattern slightly longer. Um, and in 1690, this violin that you played on um, was red in varnish. That's a big change, because before that, all violins that were made were yellow, light orange yellow. Um, and I think the fact that the Medici family in Florence ordered a quartet of Stradivaris or quartet from Mr. Stradivari um, with a red color, which kind of must have been the new thing to have. He started in that year because of that contract, because in 1690 he built a quartet for the Medici court in red. 
uh, influenced him from then on to cook a different varnish or have the local alchemist mix him a varnish that is more red. And so this violin is a beautiful display of an unbelievably transparent, fiery red varnish. It's absolutely beautiful in my mind. Thank you so much, Florian, for being here with us. It's been an it's absolute honor. Um, and now we can move on to a couple of questions mm -hmm. from the, sure, the wonderful you. musicians we have here today who are so excited to listen to you and to meet you. A lo largo de la charla se menciona múltiples veces a los violines Stradivarius y demás violines de la época. Aparte de dicho instrumento, ¿qué otros de la familia de las cuerdas también obtienen distinción, ya sea por sus características, composición o calidad? Incluyendo el hecho de que sé que Stradivarius confeccionó más instrumentos, pero ¿qué otros instrumentos como el contrabajo o el cello se consideran de alta gama o alta calidad pertenecientes a la misma época que los Stradivarius? Mm -hmm. So Stradivari made uh, even uh, some guitars. Um, I don't know of any double bass, but he made cellos. So we have still 62 cellos in existence today. He made some violas. We know of 11 surviving violas, or 10 and a half if you want, um, because one is in, a co is in a composite state. And um, we know about 650 violins in existence today of probably 1,200 instruments that he would have likely ma had made during his lifetime together with his sons and other assistants. Every violin maker had assistants that were working under the direction and the ideas of the Grand Master. And Stradivari was already during his lifetime very successful. Um, because Stradivari lived so long, he left also most instruments behind in numbers, so there's no other violin maker of that time that we know of has produced as many, many. instruments, except for makers in, in Milan, like the Testoro and Grancino, these families, they made much rougher, faster built instruments, mm -hmm. more efficiently built, and of those, uh, and, and they had many people working with them, and therefore the quality could uh, be very varied as well. Um, sometimes a great example, some bad example, thin, narrow, lots of different uh, features on those instruments. And they made a lot of double basses and mm -hmm. big cellos, because the cellos have been very often cut down. So they had a so-called basetto. Mm -hmm. So the cello was not always the size that we know it of today, while the violin was pretty much this size, hmm. quite early. En el caso de que alguien haya cometido el error de limpiar su instrumento utilizando alcohol, ¿qué tipo de barniz se podría utilizar y su proceso para restaurarlo? Una preguntita, ¿alcohol, pero en el barniz o solamente eh, en el barniz? En el barniz. And never ever use alcohol to clean your varnish. What you can do is if you want to use alcohol to clean your strings in the fingerboard, to never put the violin like this and, and clean your fingerboard because something might drip. Even if you, what you should do is you put away from the violin some alcohol in, on a cloth and then make sure it's completely not even. Not dripping. Not dripping, completely just humid. And also the hand that you touched it with it's not touching the violin again, so you make sure it's also clean. And then you put the violin with one end on your forehead and you clean your fingerboard and strings from underneath. Because if anything might still drip, it can only drip down this direction and not upwards mm. onto the violin. Wow. The minute you do like this, some little drops might yeah. fall and you have a disaster. It's mm. a big disaster if you have such a fine violin. And what you want to do is, even as a child, you get used to treating a violin the way it should be treated. It's the same when you have a car, you don't drive it without oil in the engine. If after two years all your oil is burned, you have to fill it back in or you have to make an oil change because all the wear of the engine is being tossed around in through the engine 
and it slowly wears the engine out and then blue smoke comes out in the back. So the same way you treat your car engine, or should be, you also have to learn to treat a violin automatically. Hmm. Thank you so much, Florian, for this time. Thank you so much for coming here. It's been an honor and a privilege to have you as our guest of honor for this fifth musical clinic, which we had today for the first day, and we will carry on in the month of December. Thank you for being so kind to all of us. I have learned incredibly, and as I said, to have you here in the Dominican Republic. Thanks to Banco Popular for this space and um, the wonderful time we've had here. Um, just a big thank you from us. Thank you very much. <laughs>